Phoenix about a year ago or two years ago when we were talking about in a management outing about needing to have a man on the moon vision. And I said, well, hell, we have a man on the moon. It's Neil Armstrong. Because Neil Armstrong, uh, as, as the uh, part of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, pointed out that the top rated improvement to the life of Earthlings in the 20th century is electrification. And uh, that, that, is some, that is the reason why we use coal the way we use coal. This goes back to the earliest days of coal use in the United States. That's FDR signing the Rural Electrification Act in uh, 1930, where he states high rates, of course, bear hard on the individual. But from a social standpoint, they are chiefly to be regretted because they restrict the use of electricity. And Hu Jintao, the president of China, uh, out uh, now now is uh, Xi Jinping, um, uh, also an engineer, as Hu Jintao was, pointing out the country with coal dominating its energy structure, China, still has a huge potential. We will put in place a system that supplies stable, economic, and clean energy, and they are doing that by growing the use of coal. Universal electrification is the only path to eradicate energy poverty. We found that first in the U.S., and there's a quote there from Senator George Nor Norris from uh, Nebraska, um, and the um, uh, Senator, N the state of Nebraska is a public power state. That's my background, co-ops and municipals before I joined Peabody. Uh, China, electrification in China, and India is starting to follow that path. <clears throat> My boss, our, our chairman and CEO, Greg Boyce, put this vision on the table in, in Montreal in 2010 at the World Energy Congress. The greatest crisis we confront in the 21st century is not an environmental crisis predicted by computer models, but a human crisis fully within our power to solve. So, study after study and pure common sense tells us that access to electricity helps people live longer and better and for every agency voicing a 2050 greenhouse gas goal, we need 10 working toward the goal of broad energy access to reduce global poverty. And there are the current figures right there. Of the, the uh, seven billion people on Earth today, over a billion lack any electricity, and over two billion lack adequate uh, access to electricity. And the importance of that is captured in the, in the graph on the left. More people live longer and live better when they use more electricity, full stop, period. That is, that's the graph, and that's the Human Development Index uh, from the United Nations. On the right, you see the absolute correlation between coal-fired electricity growth and the growth in global GDP, uh, as near to one to one as you can get, and that continues, of course, today. Greg, in uh, 2010, August of New 2010, put this uh, eradicating energy poverty concept on the table. The International Energy Agency had never said the words energy poverty, ever. Six weeks later, they came out with this, their benchmark, down on the lower left. It was in Paris when we were at the uh, CIAB um, uh, meeting for, for the IA, the Coal Industry Advisory Board. And uh, the, uh, then, the then executive director of, of uh, EIA, IEA put this on the table, and I thought to myself, how appropriate we're sitting in Paris where Maria Antoinette said, them, said, let them eat cake, because that's what that is. Every human on earth has a right to live as every, every person in this room, everyone on earth. We use more electricity in the United States than the, e, than the Euro area does but we use the Euro area to be con conservative. And you can see the IEA benchmark, a, f a fraction of that, a few hours a day running an electric stove and a radio versus how the rest of us live or how we live in the OECD West. And that's because of urbanization and electrification. And that's what's gonna drive our future. So the UN came out three days ago with this new figure. 9.6 billion people by 2050 instead of the nine billion previously thought. A lot of that is in Africa, of course, but nonetheless, 9.6 billion. 87% of those people uh, will be in the developing world of the increase. And you can see the, uh, the placards there, uh, seven billion people celebrating, which I think is a celebration. I like humans, I like life. More people living longer, living better. <clears throat> there are more coming, and we're going to need everything we have. We surely are going to need more coal.
these are metrics in terms of what is anticipated for, for global GDP growth, uh, near triple by, by 2050, electricity generation more than double, steel production more than double, world population 9.3 billion, now 9.6, and we see 15 billion tons of coal used annually, up from 7.8 7 billion today. That's an extraordinary number, but it's a 3% CAGR, so it's not that extraordinary. <clears throat> An historical footnote, Al Gore wrote Earth in the Balance, and that book was issued in 1992. He reissued that book in 2000. In 1992, the world used 3.8 billion tons of coal. This year, the world is going to use close to 8 billion tons of coal. In 2000, when it was reissued, the, the world probably was at five, five to six billion tons of coal. There was nothing in that book on terrorism, by the way, and it was a year before 9-11. There's very little in that book about China-led Asia developing, and in the last 10, in the, in the 13 years since then, there's been an explosion. And in that book, in 1992 and in 2000, he styled the American society as, quote, dysfunctional, end quote, because of the energy and the electricity that we use. We strongly disagree with that point of view. Those views of the vice president are important views. They're in the world today. They're in the EPA efforts in the United States, which I'll talk about briefly. But they are at odds with what is actually going on in the world, as opposed to what is portrayed as going on in the world. What's going on in the world is what you see in front of you, Hong Kong. Urbanization, electrification. Urbanization, a billion people in the next 10 years in China-led Asia going into cities, a billion. What does that mean? A billion people in the next 13 years, by 2025. What does that mean for steel in the ground? What does that mean for electricity? Where does the electricity come from? It's going to happen. It comes from coal. Is that a good or a bad thing? It's a good thing, based on recorded human history. This is a study we commissioned, Peabody commissioned in 2006, from uh, Penn State University, Frank Clementi, who some of you know. This is China out of poverty. Surviving childhood, living longer, drinking cleaner water, eating better, better educated, even as coal use soared in China. It, it enabled it, coal use in China. And the IEA has recognized this. So using more coal is a good thing, not bad. The, the social benefits from coal use as opposed to the social cost of carbon are massive and swamp speculation from computer models and, and a formula, by the way, at OMB that really does not capture the benefits of what I'm putting on the board here today. We are going to capture those benefits and you will know about them, promise you. Because coal is the world's fastest growing fuel, twice as fast as average of other major fuels in the past decade, expected to pass oil as world's largest energy source in coming years, and the new IEA reporting increases global gold global coal growth projections 47% by 2035. Annual world coal demand to grow 1.2 billion tons in five years. Did that not go forward? It did not. There it is. 1.2 billion tons. This year we're going to use 900 million tons for electricity generation in the U.S. That's over a double, or, or that's over what we use in the U.S. in the next five years worldwide. Coal generation of 425 gigawatts by 2017. Steel production, an additional 150 million tons per year of metallurgical coal. And the, and the growth of that will be led by China and India, as we will see in one second. People talk about taking coal out. Clearly, the, e, the EPA in the United States wants to take coal out in lieu of natural gas. If you took that and you looked at that worldwide, those are the metrics on what you'd need, clearly you can't do it, to replace coal generation. The, the nuclear is obviously promising, hugely expensive. Prairie State that I'll talk about here in a minute is say, has annualized, normalized cost of $55 a megawatt hour. I'm told that a new nuclear unit uh, at current CapEx costs to pay off capital is $100 a megawatt hour before operating costs. Natural gas internationally is priced off oil. So in Asia, that's getting put in there in the, in the teens, 15 to $20. In Europe, at $10. Our, we have an unusual and special situation in the U.S., been great for our economy, I believe. 
uh, but that probably changes. Hydro, wind, and solar, obviously you can't go there. And China-led Asia is, is where this, the growth is coming from. You know, between India and the People's Republic of China and the other countries in Asia, there are 4.2 billion people, 4.2. So there are 300 million of us here going to 400 or 450 million of us. There are 10 times that there. All of you that have been there know that there is a lot of work to do in terms of people living better there. And as they live better, they're gonna use more energy. And as they use more energy, they're going to use coal. And who said that? Yesterday, the, the current executive director at the IEA said that, that coal was gonna take the lion's share of the, of the electric load growth in China-led Asia in the next five years. But we live in the US, and let's talk about the US. We are a developing nation. So when I go abroad, I say we're a developing nation. They look at me like I'm crazy. We have a developed economy, true, but we're a developing nation because our population is growing. <clears throat> I grew up in the desert southwest, Phoenix, Arizona. I lived here 30 years, where are you from? I'm from Phoenix. I lived in St. Louis 13 years, where are you from? I'm from Phoenix, I'm from Phoenix. In Phoenix, uh, we have growth. We have six million people there today. Uh, almost four million people in Phoenix. When I graduated from high school, I'm not gonna tell you, but you can look it up. There were 350,000 people there. The United States is a growing nation. We're gonna have 430 million people in the next 35 years. That's gonna, they're gonna go into cities. The economic growth commensurate that is going to be immense. We will need low cost available energy for jobs, growth, and prosperity. Today, we coal fuels 40% of power of our electric energy. We know clean coal technologies work. We know beneficial electric electrification is the foundation of modern life. And we know at Peabody, based on what we do and how we live our lives every day and what we see, that, that the Environmental Protection Agency's plan in the United States of America to increase electricity costs is adverse to human health and welfare. The Clean Air Act talks about protecting human health and welfare. Increasing electricity costs is adverse to human health and welfare. And that's an argument we will be making in good faith, professionally, and prevailing. EIA says that coal will remain the dominant electricity source for fuel in the United States. And that's a, roughly a 40% number today. Uh, you see the dip that we went through last year. And, and a rebound, which is going on right now, uh, with coal at 40%. And here's a, here's a part of the world that understands what I'm talking about. Even if the North, Northeast or Washington, D.C. Or, or California understands it imperfectly, we understand it in the Midwest. And we understand it because of the electric rates you're looking at. And you see the lower end of the scale with Missouri and Indiana, for example, Missouri's 80% coal fired, Indiana's 90% coal fired. So when someone says they want to take your electricity rates up 80% from the coal plants, people pay attention and will continue to pay attention. Democrats and Republicans alike, promise you. Um, part, of the, part of this story is the over-reliance on natural gas. What will that do to us? We're gonna hear a good friend here, a new friend, talking about LNG today. LNG is hugely important as an export commodity and to import. We believe in markets. Uh, we believe in using all of our resources. We also know that in Asia, they take LNG in China into, into Shanghai or, or Tianjin at $16, $17 an MCF. We're paying $4 here. We know in Europe they're at $10. We pay $4 here. We know that every natural gas company in the United States of America has a duty to its shareholders to get priced at, at the highest price they can, and that's oil, and that's in the high teens. And we also know that the, probably the only way that happens in the United States is if the government imposes it through EPA um, regu regulation by driving the American economy to natural gas as the single, as the dominant fuel. <clears throat> this, these graphs here, Show, show are based off a footnote in the first EPA order, an SPS order, that has that coal, uh, the coal plants with carbon capture and storage with a cost going up 80%. That's an EPA number. It's not in the second order, it's in the first order. 
and the first order is accurate. The coal, coal from uh, current, the current units might be $30 to $40 a megawatt hour, let's say. This would take it up another $40 or $50, uh, maybe even uh, more than 80%, but they had 80%. <clears throat> An 80% increase in coal-based electricity as the dominant fuel would, we believe, would, would result in these rate increases per year uh, in the coal-centric states that you see there. And nationally, this is what we believe happens. We go from $369 billion to $664 billion nationally. <clears throat> and we know that unemployment and electricity prices are, are closely correlated. And that's a major part of the story in the Midwest and will be a major part of the story in the Midwest going forward as we engage, as EPA is engaging on a state-by-state -state basis. The coal industry, the coal-based electric generation Utilities will engage at the state level and tell the story as EPA proceeds with its regulatory agenda to limit coal in the United States. We have examples of other jurisdictions that have done this. This is Europe. So what happened in Europe with their anti-coal policies? Their electricity rates have gone up in, in Germany at the high end, 33.8 cents a kilowatt hour. The average in the U.S. is 11.7. If you live in Virginia, where we lived, it might be eight or nine cents. Missouri is seven to eight cents. But you see France, U.K., Spain, Italy, Germany. Even the Washington Post, the day before Earth Day, this year, instead of a model for the world to emulate, Europe has become a model of what not to do with their carbon policies. This is Spain. Spain, which went all in on renewables, 100% went from 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour in 2008 to 27 cents a kilowatt hour in 2013. Good job. Who gets hurt there? People, terribly. A, a vivid example of carbon policy gone wrong. Australia, we heard a reference to the car, a carbon tax, the previous speaker. Australia had a carbon tax, and it cost the labor government uh, their ruling the, the, the prime minister seat with Tony Abbott from the coalition overturning uh, uh, Prime Minister Gillard. And it was all about the carbon tax. Australia, the people in Australia live on an ocean of coal. It's under their feet. They have huge amounts of coal. They're paying 27 cents a kilowatt hour. Carbon tax, renewable set aside. Primary cause, high electricity prices. And Ontario. Ontario is now losing industry to Michigan, to Michigan. Why? They took their coal plants out. They had four major coal plants that burned 10 to 15 million tons a year of Wyoming coal. They took them out. That's what's happened to their rates as a result of that. 100% carbon play. So you've got every jurisdiction that has tried it, everyone, everywhere, have resulted in skyrocketing electricity prices, hurting people living their lives every day setting back development in those communities, setting a policy that is adverse to human health and welfare, not advancing human health and welfare. And the granddaddy of them all, California. <laughs> they started this in 1980. I was there. I watched it. <laughs> I watched it go up and up and up and up and up, and that's what happened. California. They say they're energy efficient. Yeah, no wonder. Nobody can afford it. And the, and the industries that left California, 700,000 jobs, are not on the coast. Everybody loves going to the coast. I've got kids that live on the coast. I love going to the coast. I grew up in Phoenix. We'd go to San Diego to get out of the heat. It's a fabulous place. But if you go to the Central Valley, every industry that could leave left. And the only ones that didn't leave couldn't leave, like refineries around Vallejo and places like that. But California did it. They did it on purpose, and they're doing it more. And as those rates go up, this will continue. Jobs lost due to rate increases. This is a national aggregate. There are other reasons why manufacturing went from 17.3 million to 11.7 million jobs. The Delta is about 6 million lost over that time frame. But if you go to talk to a governor in the Midwest, they'll tell you high electricity prices are a reason, because they are a reason. So that's why we believe what we believe in terms of 
why coal is the fastest growing fuel will continue to be so and will be the dominant fuel in the U.S. When we talk about why coal, we also talk about, high, what, about how coal. And we are a major believer in technology as the answer. Uh, this, this, we, Greg Boyce used this slide in Beijing saying coal is not the problem for air pollution, it's the solution in China, in the big cities. By taking the pollution out from the direct use of coal in the cities to the power plants in the suburbs. This is the Peabody plan that, that Greg put on the table in Montreal, replace older coal fleet basically with supercritical plants. Um, and you see the, the uh, particulars there. This is the record that we have of improved air quality in the United States, um, an 87% reduction, but also a, a timeline for developing advanced coal to improve our, our carbon footprint and also get to near zero emissions across the board. Uh, this is a, they, these are more specifics on that. Uh, the criteria pollutants, SOX, NOx, um, particulates, mercury is a co-benefit in there too, and also a 30% reduction in CO2 uh, by, by putting in advanced 21st century coal today. <clears throat> Every 21st century coal plant takes a million cars off the road because of the reduced greenhouse gas footprint. That's an efficiency gain. Right now there's 175 gigawatts of new supercritical coal online or going in uh, in China. Uh, the U.S. has 96 gigawatts mostly built. There are some remaining going in and you can see the, the rest of the world. But this is a hugely important development. Uh, and that's Maria van der Hoven, the executive director of IEA, uh, who made the quote about uh, taking the million tons off the road. This is a power plant that Peabody itself is, in, is involved in with uh, in southern Illinois, Prairie State, a brand new supercritical pulverized coal. Uh, when it is normalized, the operating cost will be $55 a megawatt hour. We'll have near zero criteria emission pollutants uh, and a 25% and a, uh, drop from the oldest operating fuel plants in terms of CO2 emissions. And there is a picture of Prairie State. That's about an hour and a half from our office. <clears throat> a four to five billion dollar project for uh, 1,600 megawatts. When people wonder about the political power of coal, here's one reason. This is the ownership of Prairie State. I think there are nine states there, and, and you can see that there are nine pretty important states because they're right in the heartland. And it's not just the presidential election, it's the senatorial elections and the House of Representatives, where, where every, every one of the coal reps that you read about come from. The Ed Whitfields and the John Chimpkisses and, and uh, Speaker Boehner is from Cincinnati. Um, you get down into Virginia, and uh, Cantor uh, is a majority leader. So it is the political base of the, of of the coal chain industry, the protectors are from there. And they're not just Republicans, they're Democrats too. And that's gonna continue and that's going to grow as this story is better understood. China uses coal the way the, the, way the world uses oil. And that's one reason why they're, the, you read about coal growth sto slowing down in China? Yeah, might. It's at 3.8 billion tons today. When I started at Peabody, it was two. Uh, can, can, you, can you double and then double? Uh, I think you can double, they will double uh, from here. You can't double over that. But a big part of it is how they use it for, for natural gas, for oil, for chemicals. Probably as much coal is used for those three purposes as we use in the U.S. Besides shale gas, here's another competitive advantage the U.S. says, and I've just got two more of these buried. And this is the enhanced oil recovery in the Gulf states. Uh, the Kemper plant that, that is now EPA's uh, best available control technology under their proposed new plant rule for greenhouse gases happens to be in the Gulf states. So Kemper is going to work. Kemper will be great. Kemper will be commercialized. Uh, the cost profile for the gasification will come down. That, will, that plant will make money both for electricity and for the CO2 sold as a feedstock. But St. Louis isn't on the Gulf of Mexico. So when you look at Prairie State, I can't get access to those EOR plants, so by definition it's not backed, and that's why the NSPS, the new rule, isn't gonna stand. It's, there, there are very limited parts of the United States that have access to EOR. In that space, would it, be, would it be backed? I'm not sure it would be backed, but they'd have an argument, but they surely don't have an argument where they're talking about geologic storage as opposed to an carbon capture utilization and storage. 
And that's, that's where the e EPA analysis breaks down and why it's fatally flawed. I do want to say that we remain, Peabody remains a participant, an enthusiastic participant in future gen to develop CCS, geologic storage. That is a work in progress. That's not even close to being best available control technology. Nobody's doing it. Uh, but this is an oxy combustion plant in Illinois. I think it will. I think it will go forward and get done ultimately, and we will prove out CCS. But the costs are going to be high, and we're going to have to socialize that cost if we decide we want to go down that route. Uh, Peabody is the only non-Chinese state-owned enterprise partner in Green Gen near Tianjin. This is a gasification unit. It's much like Kemper, <laughs> using their own gasifier technology and the enhanced oil recovery is the first step there. We are very proud of that. We are an enthusiastic participate, participant in that. And finally, there's a list of the uh, initiatives that we are involved in on the green, what we call the green coal side of that, of, of this equation. And let me say in closing that we are enthusiastic in this space too. You know, from a personal standpoint, I got involved in coal through the co-ops and the municipals, and I believe in low-cost electricity, and all the metrics that you put up anywhere in the world show that that's right. <clears throat> Civilization itself advances because of low-cost electricity, and you have to use coal in that space. But as a participant in the largest shareholder coal company in the world, and as an important part of an industry where the world's most important fuel, we recognize the need to deal with the concerns over CO2. And we advance the, what we believe very strongly is the only way you can do it is through technology. We are going to use coal. We have to find a way to advance these, these technologies that reduce the carbon, glide, carbon emission profile on coal, which is a glide path over time. Patience and the passage of time Hard work, investment, incremental is how we're going to do it. In the meantime, the world's going to use more coal. So join with us in, in ways to find um, how to use it cleaner. Thank you very much.